Your Excellencies, Head of Organizations and Agencies, Distinguished Colleagues, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. You are welcome to this online advocacy event tagged Water and Climate Change, Women's Coping Strategies in West Africa, holding today, Tuesday, 13th October 2020 via this Zoom platform. This online event is jointly organized by UNESCO Multisectoral Regional Office Abuja and UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, WAP Perugia, Italy, with the facilitation of a UNESCO Category 2 Center, namely Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management, Kaduna, Nigeria. The event will serve as a platform to um, share knowledge on women's specific roles in relation to water challenges and how their coping strategies contribute to achieving water security. It would also uh, serve as a platform to create awareness on the upcoming training on sex desegregated data, water data collection and, and analysis to support developing uh, a gender data baseline and for monitoring gender equality progress in relation to national water planning and policies. And then we also expect that during this time, uh, we'll introduce the 2019 UNESCO World Water Assessment Program Toolkit on sex desegregated data, water data. Uh, before we go ahead, I would like to, at this point, um, to inform you of the following ground rules that will help us to have a smooth uh, event. Please uh, activate the mute function, especially for the panelists when you are not speaking to avoid background noise. And then place your microphone correctly if you are using a headset. Place the microphone in the front of your chin not in front of your mouth to avoid very loud uh, uh, background sounds. You can enter your question for the attendees, especially uh, for this for the participants. You can enter your question or comment in the Q&A box. And then at the end, uh, we will compile these and read out to the panelists to uh, at attend to these questions that you have raised. And if we have time, we, uh, we, we can permit uh, one or more interventions from the participants. That's, that will happen during the Q&A session. Your Excellencies, Head of Organization and Agencies, distinguished colleagues, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I would like to call to welcome us to this online advocacy event, a seasoned administrator. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience in international education development leadership, program design, implementation, and administration. He has been serving as a senior education advisor in the UNESCO Regional Office Abuja, and now he is the acting director of the UNESCO Regional Office Abuja. Please make welcome uh, Mr. Laminso. Mr. Laminso, the floor is yours to welcome us to this online event. Thank you very much, uh, Enam, for welcoming me and allowing me to take the floor on this very important event. Uh, my name is Mamadou Laminso. I'm the acting uh, regional director uh, for the UNESCO Abuja Multisectoral Regional Office. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants. Your Excellency, the Honorable Minister, of Water Resources of Nigeria. Your Excellency, the Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources, Ghana and Vice President of AMCO for West Africa. The Executive Director of National Water Resources Institute. The Director of the National Center for Integrated River, River Basin Management. The Director of ECOWAS Commission Water Resources Coordinating Center. The UNESCO Chair on Water, Woman, and Power of Decision. My colleague, uh, Mr. Lansana Wome, Deputy Country Representative of UN Women Nigeria. My colleague, Abu Amani, Director of Water Division at UNESCO Headquarters. My colleague, Michela Mileto, Acting Director. 
UNESCO WAP. Other colleagues present, very distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols duly observed. I am very delighted to welcome you to this important online event tagged Water and Climate Change, Women's Coping Strategies in West Africa. This theme is indeed very important to us as it has to do with the two-pronged priority of UNESCO, Africa and gender. The United Nations World Water Development Report 2020 states, and I quote, climate change will affect the availability, quality and quantity of water needed for basic human needs. Thus, undermining enjoyment of the rights, basic rights to safe drinking water and sanitation for billions of people around the world, end of quote. This really calls for concern, especially as water is intrinsically linked with human health, poverty reduction, gender equality, food security, livelihoods, and the preservation of ecosystems, as well as economic growth and social development of societies. Water is also very central in achieving the sustainable development goals. And in West Africa, reports have shown that acceptable water quality still remains a challenge. This challenge is even worsened by the visible impact of climate change in Africa, including but not limited to deforestation, flooding, droughts, soil erosion, coastal storms, and changing weather patterns. Unfortunately, women are disproportionately affected by this impact of climate change because of their close connection to the environment and dependence of natural resources. In coping with water scarcity effects of climate change, women, mostly those in rural areas of Africa, trek long distances to locate safe water and hold it home. In rural sub-Saharan Africa, 37% of the population is 30 minutes or more away from a safe drinking water source. According to report of the United Nations De Department of Economic and Social Affairs, some studies have shown that women at some points had to cut grass for livestock or even move these livestock around in search of water. These coping mechanisms employed by these rural women even combine to increase their vulnerability to climate change. Furthermore, most rural women in Africa lack necessary right and access to resources, information and decision making vital to overcoming the challenges posed by climate variability as they are always found at home, engaged in one household core or the other. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with the caliber of panelists we have here this morning, I'm convinced that you will have more details on the daunting challenges of climate change especially as it affects water and what can be done within our respective mandates to help women cope better. Uppermost in mind is the need to have a gender perspective in national planning purposes, especially for water and climate variability adaptation policies. For SHAS policies, there is a requirement for collection and analysis of sex disaggregated water data collection and analysis to support developing a gender data baseline and for monitoring gender equality progress. It is in this note I'm happy to inform you that UNESCO is bringing its mandates to bear to assist member states 
develop such baseline data for evidence-based gender sensitive policy formulation. UNESCO and WOP have developed a water and gender toolkit on sex disaggregated water data, which can help member countries develop baseline sex data needed to formulate policies that will ultimately eliminate any adaptation measures or mitigation actions that discriminate against gender responsiveness. At this point, I would like to inform you that UNESCO Regional Office, Abuja, has covered coverage in eight West African countries, namely Benin, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Togo. In line with the objectives of our office, a strategy on cooperation, we have joint efforts with our sister office in Perugia, UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, WOP, to organize this online event as facilitated by the UNESCO K2 Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management uh, in Kaduna, Nigeria. We are indeed grateful to have the presence of the Honorable Minister of Water Resources of Nigeria, who has been supportive of UNESCO's work and hosting UNESCO K2 Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management in Kaduna, Nigeria. We appreciate also the presence of the Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources of Ghana and Vice President of AMCO for West Africa. Permit me to acknowledge all our very distinguished panelists who will be making interventions with the confidence you have shown already by your attendance. I'm confident that we will achieve far-reaching results. And please, before I conclude this address, I would like to acknowledge the good work of the science team of UNESCO Abuja office, the UNESCO WAP team, and RCREBM team. I wish you a fruitful event, and I wish you all the most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lamine, for that warm welcome. Thank you. We appreciate you. Um, ladies, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, our next speaker uh, is a brilliant engineer and hydrologist who has served as a regional hydrologist for Africa in charge of the implementation of the UNESCO International Hydrological Program, IHP, in Sub-Saharan Africa. He contributed to raising the visibility of IHP in Africa and built strategic partnerships with key regional water stakeholders in providing support to Africa member states. He's currently the director of the water division within the science sector of UNESCO. He is Mr. Abu Amani. The floor is yours, sir, to give your, your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enang, for this introduction. Good morning to all of you. Uh, your Excellencies, uh, Honorable Minister of Water Resources in Nigeria, Your Excellency, uh, Honorable Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources, Republic of Ghana, and also Vice President of AMCO for the West Africa sub-region, very distinguished speaker and panelists, dear colleagues from UNESCO and UN STEM at large, dear colleagues from UNESCO Water Family and Friends, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I'm delighted and honored to be with you, even if virtually, for the open ceremony of this advocacy webinar on water, climate change, and gender in West Africa. In my capacity as the director at interim of the water division and secretary of the International Hydrological Program of UNESCO, I would like to convey the best wishes of our assistant director general for natural science sector, Dr. Shamila Nerbedwell. I would like to thank the excellencies 
for their participation in this event, which is a clear testimony of the political commitment in addressing water and climate change challenges within the sub-region. I would like also to thank all the speakers, panelists, partners, and the participants for responding positively to our invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change projections from IPCC have clearly identified West Africa as a climate change hotspot with risk on food security and health to waterborne diseases. The World Water Development Report 2020 on water and climate change calls for a gendered approach to the differential impact of climate change on women and men with the participation of women in climate-related policy development. In the face of health crises like the COVID-19 one, women and girls seem to be unfortunately more at risk. Ladies and gentlemen, SDG 6 on water and sanitation is unfortunately off track. COVID-19 has painfully reminded us the urgency to address the challenges related to the access of clean water and sanitation for all. Massive investments on water accompanied with human capacity development are needed particularly in Africa in order to accelerate the implementation of SDG 6. Empowerment of girls and women is crucial for any meaningful progress on SDG 6. The UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, WAP, in partnership with the UNESCO multi regional Office of Abuja, has launched a capacity development program for the West African region to shed light on women's specific roles in relation to challenges and how coping strategies to contribute to achieving the security and community resilience. The program is designed, among others, to strengthen the capacity of governmental officials of water institutions in the use of WAP water and gender toolkit and to understand how gender data can help in formulating gender transformative water policies in West Africa. This capacity building program will be implemented in partnership with the UNESCO Tegur II Center, namely the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management located in Abuja. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar is organized to introduce the key, key officials from water-related ministries, ministries and institutions to the main concept of gender equality in women empowerment, applied water resource management in the context of climate change. The, what, the work tools for sex disaggregate water data collection and analysis as well as the related training from gender concept data-based gender transformative water policies will be introduced. In concluding, I would like to ensure UNESCO country support in accelerating the implementation of SDG 6 for resilient societies and building back better. I would like once again to thank the excellencies for the support and to congratulate my colleagues from UNESCO Abuja office and the World Water Assessment Program for organizing this very important webinar. I wish you a very successful meeting and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abu Amani, for 
that's very good remarks, reassuring us of UNESCO's um, support for member states to achieve the SDG 6 and build back better, especially uh, with the situation that we are now. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I have the honor to call on Her Excellency, the Honorable Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources of the Republic of Ghana, Madam Cecilia Abenadapa. She was invited in her capacity as the Vice President of African Ministers Council of Water Amkau for West Africa's sub-region. She is represented today by Engineer Kwabena Gyasiduku. Engineer Kwabena is a civil engineer with the specialized skills in with specialized skills in monitoring and evaluation. He is currently the head of the policy planning, budgeting, monitoring, and evaluation directorate at the Ministry of Sanitation and Water. And he is also a, a Ghana representative on the technical advisory committee of AMCAO, as well as Ghana's focal points on monitoring and evaluation committee of AMCAO. Engineer Duku, the floor is yours to give us a brief remarks on behalf of Her Excellency. Thanks so much, Madam. Good morning once again. Your Excellency, the Honorable Minister of Water, Nigeria, and other protocols of the We thank you so much for this opportunity. And let me first start by granting the messages of the, the Her Excellency, the Honorable Minister for Sanitation and Transport Ghana. For any ability to join this morning's meeting, actually she's being called for a cabinet meeting this morning. So all the cabinet ministers are having a meeting right now currently. Uh, okay, that was why the reason why she couldn't join this meeting this morning. Thanks so much for making us for the proposal to have this meeting. Thanks also to my school for organizing such a wonderful meeting. One in front of these times of COVID. You know, COVID is, is now here with us and uh, we've worked with to it's difficult for us to actually practice the protocols to it. Max being effect. So, thanks so much to UNESCO for bringing us to part of the year. We cannot only cope, especially during this time when we need water so much. And so, the issue of climate change also being with us, because the issue of climate change, we don't have enough water and there are water reliability issues. They can be flooding, they can also be drought. So, she, she uh, said to regards that she thanks you so much for organizing such, such a meeting. And I hope that this meeting will bring out the needed for us to know what, how you can actually plan so that it can actually mitigate most of the negative impact climate change will bring to our force, especially when we are facing these times. On the African platform, like with AMCA, like coming being, being a, like the attack vice chair for AMCA for the Western African South region. AMCA is doing a lot. That's why we're doing, we're doing our program for the 2019-2024 strategic region plan. We had the our as part of our one of our key, key main goals was to see how we can actually reduce water stress within countries. Not only within our Western African sub region, but also across the entire African continent. So at least Countries can come up with the needed technology to need and they should at least be able to have enough water to actually ensure that the development of most of our industry because water, as we all know, is a catalyst to development. And also, as part of our cross cutting uh, issues on climate change, we are member countries to have knowledge in funding for it. It's creating climate change results in all what we do, both in water and certain steps. Yeah, but I want member countries to develop guidelines to integrate climate change with nice. As mitigating in other skill projects, also develop capacities on how to actually assess climate change funding so they can actually put up initiatives that will help benefit the local people who are always at the core of what we do. In Ghana, we have done a lot in terms of climate change because climate change, as you all know, occurs naturally and it's also at risk to humankind. So, humankind must be able to cope to it. That's what happened today in this morning. Like how we can actually cope with the issues of climate change, how we can also adapt to, to the impacts. The poor, as you all know, are the most vulnerable to climate change vulnerability. But they were, and also those are also, most of the times we don't have the capacity to cope. That's why it's also good for us, like these events are being done, so that you can actually plan holistically to ensure that at least we can have all synergy to ensure that at least we have enough we need synergy and efforts to confront issues that arises with climate change. In Ghana, we have done several things with the global water partnership, which was more or less part of to do several uh, climate change interventions within most of our north, northern uh, regions. Like that's where normally climate change issues. Okay, because they are close, close to the to the Sahara, so that is when actually risk climate change variability do okay. So we we did see how you can actually help the, the women there to actually cope the issue of climate change. So we came up with a community synthesis program. So by almost like 15 districts in the two emergencies, we're giving support to give, giving training to see how can they can actually connect efforts to conserve what's on to store water and so to really fit of flooding toward flood retention 
you know, to strengthen of existing adaptive strategies. That you can actually empower them to having to undertake dry season farming, providing them with climate change resilient so like a good forecast to see whether they are coming flats or maybe to look plant extensively to adapt to uh to act, act, act to be the most part of of of, of, of the country. In the end, it was good to know that these programs or projects were actually done to address the issues of climate change in the northern part of the country, which are also addressed also to help them to cope with them, also, but ensure that their their sustainability on the livelihoods wasn't challenged in terms of climate change programs. When the issue of soil drought or the issue of soil flooding, so in on, in a nutshell, what are some things of different kinds kind of were, were done for them? How they can actually store enough water to help or to support their daily activities. Because you actually know when there's no water, water in the house, it's the women and children that they normally suffer because they must walk long distance going and fetch water. They, they can also know, practice uh, good social uh, high, high, watch, watch practices, such as during the time of the month. So, all this was some of the issues we put in place as well. It can help build a bit of capacity or to know what they can do, which will at least be able to mitigate or reduce most of the impacts that comes out of climate change. We thank UNESCO for giving us this platform again so you can all plan to see what can be done to at least moving forward also during this time. So we did a West African summit where we have done more or less like a climate change hotspot. We can actually come up with mitigation measures or force to address our challenges and also to come up with a holistic document which will not feed only into our sub plan, but also to also make input or inroads into the upcoming plans we are developing for the continent. So currently we are doing the AS, ASP, the strategic African strategic policy, which will Trying to help African countries come up with strategic policies so that this all of us can actually strive to attain the SDG goals. Because that, that is now the hallmark we are trying to, to achieve. And what water to most of the SDG goals will also, also be a challenge in Canada to attain them. We thank UNESCO for this opportunity. We thank the, uh, all the participants who are making themselves available to, to, to share their experiences with us so that they can all learn from each other, provide our notes, and see what can be done to help that. So that it's come the year 2023, that water mission can be achieved. Come the year 2022, and also achieve these SDG targets. Thanks so much for this opportunity. And we are here to support whatever interventions or plans that will come into place. AMCAR is ready to support all these plans. And we shall make sure that it will find its way to most of the strategic plans we are developing on the continent. Thanks so much once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Duku. Thank you for that very good information, reassuring us again that AMCAO um, is working to uh, ensure that uh, women cope better uh, on, um, during the, I mean, on the water stress that's caused by climate change, and reassuring us again that AMCAO um, is ready to partner with us to uh, take actions forward. Thank you very much, Engineer Duku. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, to declare this event open, uh, I have the honor to call on a very distinguished personality with a rich pedigree in the public and private sectors of Nigeria's development. He has brought his diverse wealth of professional engineering and business experience to bear on the Nigerian water sector. He is the current chairman, Council of Ministers of the Niger Basin Authority and the Lake Chad Basin Commission. He has also been very supportive of UNESCO's activity. To, to that extent, he worked with UNESCO to host the first ever international conference on Lake Chad. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome His Excellency, the Minister of Water Resources, Nigeria, Engineer Suleiman Adamu, Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineering and Fellow of the Academy of Engineering. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, as the representative of the Minister of uh, Sanitation and Water Resources, Ghana, uh, Mr. Lemin so UNESCO Regional Office Abuja, Mr. Abu Amani, uh, other distinguished participants. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you at this webinar and uh, I must start by commending the UNESCO office for coming up with this laudable initiative toward collation of disaggregated data on climate change and women's coping strategies. Uh, is very important because uh, adequate and reliable data uh, is key to proper planning. Uh, well, it's common knowledge that Nigeria is the country with the highest population in Africa, uh, with a population of over 200 million in 2019. 
which is uh, estimated to constantly increase over the next few decades. Uh, I suspected that uh, <clears throat> this figure may double by the year 2050, uh, taking us to a population of uh, 400 million. Uh, we also have a huge urban population, 52%, <clears throat> due to uh, rural urban migration. And uh, we have a very high birth rate. Uh, although this is uh, likely to decline in a few decades, as uh, the statisticians say. Uh, and then, of course, the population, the, uh, the, the greater proportion of the population is women. Uh, so there's greater challenge in ensuring that the impact of climate change does not exacerbate the pressure on livelihoods at the family level. There's a direct link between livelihoods, enhancement, climate change, and gender. And women, of course, are in the center of the pressure because of the various roles that they have to play within the family setup. Globally and in Nigeria in particular, water availability is heavily impacted by climate change. And it is evident that women will be much more affected than men by this such impacts like increasing water scarcity, uh, increased desertification, more and heavier floods and waterborne diseases. Women's access to water is particularly compromised in situations of scarcity, as we all know. Women that are at the bottom of the ladder, those that are very poor, use uh, what, in quotes, common property resources, such as rivers and lakes, to access water more often than do men or women with higher incomes. Addressing water-related problems is central to climate change adaptation and civil society. Marginalized populations and women in particular must be involved. This is for both moral and pragmatic reasons. Not only are the marginalized the first and worst affected by extreme weather events, but they also possess local ecological, social, and political knowledge, which can inform and contribute significantly to climate change adaptation strategies. Because of their social role and position worldwide, women are greatly affected by water scarcity and flooding and tend to be gravely impacted by poor water management. And yet they face greater difficulty in participating effectively in governance bodies. So I wish to once again express my appreciation to the UNESCO office for coming with this uh, program that will help us to understand the climate change, water, women nexus for better planning. And it is my honor and privilege at this stage to declare the webinar open. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, wish you successful deliberations this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And uh, some of my colleagues are clapping here at the background. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, declaring this um, uh, webinar open. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Your Excellency, you. ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, we're moving to the next session. And to moderate this session, setting the scene, uh, it's my pleasure to call on my colleague, Mr. Lauren Toy to take over and moderate the setting the scene session. Lauren, over to you. Hello, Lauren, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Ina. Um, thank you very much, Ina. Yes, um, I hope you can all hear me now. Um, your Excellencies, distinguished uh, colleagues, dear participants, again, good morning. Um, now it is time for us to move to the setting the scene session of this webinar, in which we will have four distinctive speakers. Each of these speakers will share with us their experience on the regional and local aspect on water, climate change and gender in West Africa, while they respond to a set of questions. Uh, as mentioned before, any of the questions that you might have to the panelists, they may be posted in the chats uh, being addressed to a specific speaker. 
and they will be discussed during the Q&A session later on. Uh, each of the speakers is allowed a 10 minute uh, intervention. And our first speaker is Ms. Euphrasie Kwasi Yao. She is uh, the UNESCO Chairholder on Water, Women and Decision-Making Power in Cote d'Ivoire. In addition, Ms. Yao is Special Advisor to the President of the Republic in Charge of Gender. She's also Coordinator of the Convenium of Women's Skills of Cote d'Ivoire and former Minister of Women, Family and Child Protection. She will be kindly joined by her colleague, Mr. Alexis Chiakpe. Um, dear Ms. Yao and Mr. Chiakpe, very welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, in your function of special advisor to the president of Cote d'Ivoire on the topic of gender, you know well which are the main challenges to implement gender responsive water governance in Cote d'Ivoire and what are the institutional efforts to address them. So I would like very much to pose you two questions. The first is, are the current and future impacts of climate change incorporated in the response to these challenges? And if yes, how? And secondly, how can gender data and gender analysis efficiently inform water policies and government planning, also in uh, view of climate change adaptation? Please, uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Mm, okay, thank you. Distinguished gender, gen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my pleasure to take part in this panel and to share my experience with all the other countries. In fact, as one of the first chairs working on water and gender issues, 2006, we always enjoy to taking part in this kind of interactive meetings. We have the opportunity to share and learn from each other. Before ending to Mr. Chakwe, because of the language, I would like to share with you three distinct strategies for better, for better management of water resources and climate, climate change. I don't know if you understand me. It's okay? Okay. Very well. Okay. Three, uh, I, I say three distinct strategies for better management of water resources and climate changes. First, take into account the gender approach like development strategy in resources management. Gender like strategy is important. It's different, um, from, um, it's different from women. Secondly, we must include women who already have natural, profound uh, knowledge of water resources management. Lastly, we should seek for political commitment. And this can be measured, uh, co commitment, poli uh, come on, politman, political commitment, this can be measured by the avail availability of financial resources from our government, it's important. The creation of institutions working on gender issues in the water and climate change areas. Reinforcement of capacity of local actors in gender and development. Local actors is maybe project management, women. And development of gender program in water and climate change areas. Availability of key performance indicators to measure the change. Thank you for your attention. And I will know, I will now give the floor to Mr. Chakwe. I, I say you because of language. I want to say more, but <laughs> I don't have the word. I give the floor to Mr. Chakwe for next presentation uh, of Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you.
Mr. Chakwe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. We can hear we you. We hear you. Please hear continue me? your in yes, please continue your intervention. Please continue. Mr. Chakwe, go, we hear you. Yes, we, I'm waiting for uh, oh. I would like to share my screen. Maybe, Mr. Chape, you can just uh, summarize your presentation because uh, we don't have so much time. So you can just, if you can't share, just summarize it uh, for us. And then you can okay. share to us to, to send to the participants later. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. So climate change. Climate change is due to climate change is due to human behavior according to Kofi Ban Ki moon former secretary former general secretary of United Nations and he suggests that a solution come from humans. My presentation, my presentation will follow We follow the agenda, link between gender and water, the Atokro project, and challenge and future action. Gender is a strategy. Gender is a strategy which aims to reduce, to reduce inequality. Gender is a strategic and it is help to find solution for water access. In Cote d'Ivoire, what we implement to solve the problem this project involve women in the water management by sharing roles between men and women. This project is a solution because the initiative from government to help people in rural areas for water access failed. And this project, it is implemented in 2002-2002 is still going on. Mr. Chakwe, you can resume your intervention because we are only 10 minutes, please. Okay. So, I can roughly go for the strategy and the strategy and the income of this project. For this project, we sensibilize, we sensibilize, sensibilize, Social, social mobilization around water, 
advocacy on importance of water, mass awareness on hygiene and cleaning up, capacity building, training in gender and development, and different other relevant subjects. The economic support program for women through local product transformation. These strategies and implementation led to results in link with some SDG. A good management of water generated imports due to rural women economic empowerment. This corresponds poverty. Activities which generate income allow self sufficiency. This corresponds to goal ensure the food security, reducing the disease caused by unhealthy water. Young, young women, young girls, and young girls spend less time and find what to find water so that they have more time to study. This goal to correspond to goal four for all. Water management by men and women break existing barrier on favor decision making together. This corresponds to goal five, reaching equality between men and women. People have a sustainable access to drinking water because of the good management of the pump. This corresponds to goal six, access to water Access to water. Uh, access to water. Our challenge, the challenge we faced in the implementation, in the implementation of this project, is the resistance of traditional community leaders, skepticism of most of people, skepticism of most of people to. Future action, we try to find partnership to extend the project in villages which are not yet electrified and using solar energy. Organization of women entrepreneurs to participate in governmental initiative aiming at hydraulic pump management to sustain ministry in charge of infrastructure to relay in project extension. In conclusion, gender mainstreaming allow to identify, to resolve a developed problem. UNESCO and decision making power in Côte d'Ivoire implemented gender approach in the rural urban area. UNESCO chair work with innovative projects and programs that could be duplicated in other countries. Dear Mr. Chakpe, uh, you have a few more seconds, if possible, to, to round your intervention, and then we, we shall move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So let us be a, let not be afraid. Let's commit together to fight for water and gender and sustainable development. We must be and I finish with his quotation of Mr. Efrazi Pasi Yao. The right time for gender mainstreaming in development project is now, not tomorrow. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That's a, yeah, that's a very nice remark. Thank you to Ms. Yao and Mr. Chakpi for this uh, intervention. And uh, now I would like to introduce our second speaker, which is Mr. Ibrahim Baptunde Wilson. He is the director of the ECOWAS Commission at the Water Resources Coordinating Center in Burkina Faso. Um, a warm welcome to you, um, Mr. Wilson. Um, so climate change leading to extended periods of droughts, but also intense floods is believed to be at the root of declining water availability and subsequent conflicts, which leads to displacements. According to figures of Oxfam 2020, more than a million women and girls in Burkina Faso are facing increased sexual violence, hunger and water shortage as a result of the current coronavirus pandemic on top of the already existing conflict. These women mostly need access to water, protection, food and shelter, but sadly, the public services that continue to operate are overwhelmed, especially the health, shelter, health centers and schools, and the access of women and girls to essential public services is hence very difficult. Now, uh, could you, in your intervention, uh, describe how does ECOWAS work on improving the provision of water, sanitation and health services in the field, especially from the point of view of COVID-19 related challenges? And secondly, could you please highlight any examples of projects or activities in which ECOWAS is involved in enhancing women's and thus communities' resilience against climate change, water scarcity, and other related impacts in the West Africa region? The floor is yours. Thank you. I think uh, Mr. Wilson is encountering difficulties in connection. So um, to that extent, you might need to move to the next person. If we have him at some point join us, then we can call him. So you can move to the next person, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that he will manage to join us very soon. Okay, so then let's uh, move to our third speaker. Um, our third MDT was uh, Mr. Lansana Wone. He, um, he is an agricultural economist and currently the deputy country representative of UN Women Nigeria. Previously, he held a similar position at the UN Women Country Office in South Sudan. Um, from the years 2004 to 2013, Mr. Lansana worked for the United Nations World Food Programme and served in several capacities, including vulnerability, food security, and productive safety net specialist, and as coordinator of the UN and Government of Liberia Joint Program on Food Security and Nutrition. Now, Mr. Wane is being represented by Ms. Salamatu Kemokai. She is a senior gender and capacity building specialist at UN Women Nigeria. She's also policy specialist, humanitarian, and a peace and security specialist. Please, um, Ms. Kemokai, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. Good morning, everyone, distinguished personalities. I'm really happy um, to be here among high level panelists and um, particularly as a woman, you know, for me, I've listened to several speakers um, talking about sex and age disaggregated data. And I did my own um, quick um, uh, um, data collection. And I looked at the, you know, the list of people who are supposed to speak, um, about 12 people, and there were two women. Um, luckily, even though um, um, Madame, with Madam Cecilia Abnadapa from Ghana was re replaced by a male, Kwabna, but then at the same time, I'm also replacing Lansana, so I've been able to um, balance that. But then I'm saying this because um, quite often when we are talking about women's inclusivity, we unconsciously leave out women in these conversations. It's not deliberate, but quite often we are thinking about who are the technical people, 
who is on the table, who is in a better position. We look at the positions. We don't look at the gender. So by the time we call people to come to the table, women are absent. So for the very things that we are advocating, that we go to the communities, the women should be part of decision making. At our own level, we all do those mistakes. So I just want to draw our attention to that. Um, I would like to um, focus my interventions on um, particularly um, closing gender gaps in water governance. And for me, I would like to speak to issues of um, probably how do we define water governance, women in water governance, and then contextual examples that we all bring us uh, to, to, to be to able to see what exactly we are doing or how we may be able to improve on the things that we are doing and maybe key recommendations as well. So in providing an overview, of course, it has been made clear that water is an essential resource for both men and women. But despite the ample amount of water available in various forms, both men and women continue to experience unequal rights to water on the grounds of access, distribution, collection, and quality. And in water scarce regions and countries where we mostly find ourselves in, particularly West Africa, inequity in access to water resources is increasing because of competition for limited resources. And this particularly affects poor rural people, especially women. Of course, um, as we relate to the theme of this particular um, conference, we are talking about climate change effects and we know how that has impacted uh, on water in particular. Water scarcity is highlighted in SDG 6, and this has been said severally. Um, looking at target 6.1 in particular, one of today's many developing is the lack of equity in access to safe water. And women who are the main providers and managers of water, both in the household and in the farming community are unequally involved in the management of water. So looking at governance, water governance, water governance, we just want to be able to see what is it that we are speaking about when we talk about water governance. It relates to the range of political, social, economic, and administrative systems that are in place to develop and manage water resources and the delivery of water services at different levels of society. I know there are several definitions, but then this one I think was more appealing from Roger and Hall, and we felt that we could be able to share this um, in this conference. This includes the formulation, establishment, implementation of water policies, legislations, and institutions, and clarifications of the roles and responsibilities of government, civil society, and the private sector in relation to water resources and services. And particularly, we are talking about roles and responsibilities there because we know um, for gender roles, which we are also trying to see how much we can influence that, we have women and girls who have been assigned the role of fetching water. And when there is scarcity, we know exactly how that further affects their vulnerability. Water governance determines the quality, sorry, the equity and efficiency in water resource and health service allocation and distribution and balances water use between socioeconomic activities and ecosystems. Ensuring who gets what water, when and how, and who has the right to water and related services and their benefits. So when we are talk, looking at all of these, I know somebody mentioned gender mainstreaming. Quite often we say gender mainstreaming, but we are talking about gender mainstreaming. We need to be able to consider whatever decisions we make, how would it affect women, men, boys and girls. So as long as you have this in mind, then in your decision making, then obviously you are dealing with um, gender mainstreaming in whatever you are doing. So we say women in water governance, it has become increasingly accepted that women should play an important role in water management and that this role could be enhanced through the strategy of gender mainstreaming, which I've just spoken about. The importance of involving both women and men in the management of water and sanitation and access related questions has been recognized at the global level. So it's not just at the level uh, of us here in West Africa. And it has been shown in many cases that water projects work better when women are involved and they have a greater impact. And this has a greater impact on mobilizing finances for gender biased um, projects than showing that access to water has an impact on gender equality. 
So we also want to be able to um, look at some contextual examples. Deliberately, I want to share this example so that we can see what good practices um, have been done when women are engaged and we can also learn from these examples. I'll start from home here in Nigeria. Um, in Nigeria, the construction of a tourist resort on the Obudu Plateau led to deforestation and exacerbated pre-existing pressures on water resources and the environment, such as overgrazing and unstable agricultural practices. The local beach women complained about wasted time in collecting water, poor water quality, and poor family health. Consequently, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation started a watershed management project on the Obudu Plateau in 1999 and encouraged women to get involved in the project's decision-making process. When they did this, they were able to actually solve two problems. In the first place, a conflict between the Bective women, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it properly, I'm not originally from Nigeria, and the Fulani tribesmen over access to water was resolved through negotiation because the women were now part of the conversation. The women's health care burden was reduced with a 45% reduction in cases of diarrhea. So two problems were solved because women were involved. And I do hope that um, because I listened to the um, to the acting director of UNESCO when he was talking about the river basin management um, project in Kaduna, Nigeria, and I hope women will also be meaningfully involved in this management so that we are able to have better results. Another example I would like to share is from Ghana, and I'm happy that Kobna um, shared a um, series of good practices in Ghana, but then I just want to be able to add to that as well. The IFA supported Upper East Region Land Conservation and Smallholder Rehabilitation Projects, which ran from 1998 to 2006, encouraged the participation of landless farmers and women who were traditionally not landowners in the region. And the project adopted the following. Um, membership in water associations was not limited to farmers associated with irrigation. A quota of irrigated land allocated was established for women so that they could obtain access to water from the irrigation schemes and become involved in decision-making processes. And what was this able to yield? Women were not traditionally owners in this region, but the system has given them direct access to irrigated land. And of the participating farmers, 40% were women. If only this project had focused on the landowners, and we know that in a lot of uh, rural communities, women are not landowners, they would not have been able to, to be able to reach out to women, even though they formed 40% of um, the population that was involved um, in farming. The last example, I hope I'm not getting you bored. It's just a very simple one, but then it's important that we just have women represented, you know, at every stage of decision making so that we also get their input. An agency develops a powerful irrigation pump for agricultural improvement. This pump enabled producers to irrigate their land and reduce their dependence on rain-fed crops, which allowed for a second off-season crop, thereby significantly increasing their yield. After designing and testing the manual pumps, the development agency sold it to the entrepreneurs. During its monitoring of the product, however, it's realized that while the irrigation pump worked well, it was not an appropriate technology for women because the foot treadles were set so high. The height of the treadles made it difficult for women to use because of their long dresses, a design flaw that meant women were not, that women were losing critical opportunities to increase their production and sales. As a result of monitoring and consultation with women, the development agency adjusted the pedals so that the women could use them. So this is also drawing our attention to monitoring. Quite often in our can I, sorry to look at, um, I invite you to, to round up. Yes, I'm just trying to round. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm you. doing that now. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So I'm just saying that quite often, it's not just about um, having the development in our communities. We need to be able to also look at who is using those facilities. And this brings in the issue of the sex and age disaggregated data. 
who is using the facilities. And I'm sure if they had not done that, they would not be able to know whether the women are using these facilities. So recommendations, we need to ensure that water resource management includes women, policies must be, must be formulated to drive inclusion of women in water management, and also ensure women's effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels in decision making. And we need to recognize the value of traditional and indig indigenous knowledge, which women are often well placed to hold and disseminate. In this conference, we've had a lot of engineers speaking, but there is, it's very important that we also look at, you know, co-production of knowledge. Our women, we have very few um, as engineers or who may not have the technical capacity, but local knowledge is very important and we need to be able to source that as well. So we need to build women's capacities and create job opportunities for them in national river basin authorities, local water management entities, and water-related businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great intervention. That was really interesting, Ms. Kimokai. And I have understood that now uh, Mr. Wilson, he managed to connect with us. So if it's possible, uh, I would like to give him the floor. Mr. Wilson, Director of the ECOWAS Commission at the Water Resources Coordinating Center in Burkina Faso. Please, the floor is yours and welcome. Maybe, I don't think he heard his question. Maybe you have to go over his question again. Mr. Wilson, please, if you're here, can you can you say hello? Because you, you sent a message that you're here. Hello, Engineer yeah. Ibrahim hello? Wilson. Are you here? Yeah, hello. Yes, okay. I'm here. Can you okay, hear? good. Okay, good, sir. Uh, now, we're going to take you now. Uh, okay, so please go ahead, uh, yeah. Lauren. Great to have you, sir. Um, okay, so uh, climate change leading to extended periods of droughts, but also intense floods is believed to be at the root of declining water availability and conflicts, which leads to displacement. Now, um, figures have pointed out that over a million women and girls in Burkina Faso are facing increased sexual violence, hunger, and water shortages as a result of the current coronavirus pandemic on top of the already existing conflict. Um, so these women, they mostly need access to water, protection, food, and shelter. But the public services they are depending upon are overwhelmed, especially health centers and schools. So their access to essential public services is very difficult. Um, what we would like to ask you, Mr. Wilson, is how does ECOWAS' work how does ECOWAS work on improving this very provision of water, sanitation, and health services in the field, uh, again, in view of the COVID-19 related challenges? And also, could you please highlight any such examples of projects or activities in which ECOWAS is involved in enhancing women's and thus communities' resilience against climate change, water scarcity, and related impacts? in the West African region. Looking forward to hear from you. Thank you and welcome once more. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Hello. Go ahead, yeah. sir, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very quickly, uh, good morning, everybody. I don't need to go through all the uh, all pro protocols observed. And sorry for the technical difficulties I had with uh, the internet is now resolved. Thank you very much. Um, with regard to what we do at the ECOWAS, when it comes to girls or women and climate change and water resources, I'm going to approach it very quickly. I'm not going to take more than six or seven minutes. Firstly, to let you know where we were before I took over the offices of the um, Directorate of Water Resources resources management at the ECOWAS Commission and where we are at the moment and where we intend to go, you know, as far as the, you know, the future is concerned. Inevitably, we know in West Africa that we are very vulnerable to climate change. And what we have to do, we can't stop climate change from happening. We see it on a daily basis. Now, what we have to do is to adapt accordingly to the effects of climate change. So with regard to water resources, 
when uh, the ECOWAS Water Resources Center was set up in Burkina Faso, it was named Water Resources Coordination Center. And the word coordination is the key word there, meaning it played a coordinating role in terms of helping certain countries in West Africa to set up water basin authorities. Okay, we have about four water basin authorities already set up. We have the Senegal Water River Basin Authority. We have the Water Basin Authority. We have the Mono, which is Benin and, and, uh, and Togo and so on. And we have just created the Mano, Mano River Water Basin Authority. That's for Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, and, uh, and then Guinea. But then when I came in, I shifted the paradigm a bit. I approached it from a different standpoint. I said, now, um, let's look at water from a holistic perspective. In other words, let's take water as a resource. We should no longer play a coordinating role, but rather a management role. So we are now looking at water from the holistic perspective in that we're taking integrated water into consideration. You can add the resource itself. That is water for agriculture, water for industry, water for fishing, washing, and other domestic facilities. You have water for power generation, and what not forgetting the most important of all, water supply and sanitation. We also have water for nav navigation, where you have you know you know little boats here and they are flying one country to another or one village to another. Now, when you speak about women and girls and the effect on water resources. We see uh, it's not common only in Burkina Faso. It's across the sub-region. We see girls and women walk long distances to fetch water for their livelihoods, mainly either to feed their agricultural purposes, to meet their washing needs, or for cooking and drinking purposes. And in so doing, they leave either early in the morning or they move very long distances and they become very vulnerable to attacks, violence, and if you like, I mean, sexual abuse and all of that. So we have seen that you know women are, are, are really in the mainstream of this entire water resource management, and they are very vulnerable to all of these, in, in, in all of these attacks and whatever view from from people. Now, we have decided to shift our focus from the coordination role, like I said, that to the plane, we are shifting to a more managerial role now where we are looking at programs and projects that will help the West African sub-region. Because we see a case in example is like Sierra Leone, where I come from. We see mass movement, rural to urban migration, internally displaced people, people that were affected otherwise by either climate change or by internal conflicts or what have you. They've moved from villages you know, to urban areas, cities, and cities are now well overloaded. We have Freetown, for example, is the capital of Sierra Leone. We have a, a water supply system that was designed to take 250,000 people, to cater for 250,000 people, with a possibility of doubling that figure in about 20 or 30 years' time. To know what we see in Freetown, Freetown has about a million people, you know, out of a million people now ready in, in Freetown and the periphery of Freetown. What does that mean? It means that we have twice the number of people living out in Freetown depending on the same source, the same dam that we have, which catered for 250,000 people with a possibility to extend to 500,000. And today we're talking about a million people. So, you know, water supply services are overstretched here. Water supply services cannot simply cope with the demand of the, of the people in most of the uh, West African cities. So then what have we done? Or what are, what, are, what are we going to do to strategize to meet some of these challenges and problems that we have? Now, we have actually, in terms of projects and programs, I'm answering the, the questions, the two questions you had at the same time. The projects and programs that we have uh, as at now for the West African sub-region is to do community boreholes, yeah? Community boreholes that we help to, you know, to, 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 to get underground water and supply to communities or, or, or households as it were. Now, as I speak, we have a phase one project, yeah, which is financed exclusively by the ECOWAS. 
this every single dollar to that project is, is from the ECOWAS and not from any other development partner. partner. And it's called phase one emergency because of the COVID. It's called phase one emergency borehole project. This includes, this is for five countries, phase one emergency. Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Northern Nigeria, and Cape Verde. These five countries have been classified as they are in desperate and dire need of water for vulnerable communities. So we are going to do boreholes for them, community boreholes, and then it's, it will be driven by you know, solar photovoltaic pump systems. And then it will be community owned and they will have to manage and utilize it you know, for the, the improved life to meet the SDG six. Now, phase two on that one will be uh, for the entire 15 member states in the West African sub-region. So phase two would incorporate these phase one countries plus the remaining nine. That will be after COVID, hopefully. That will be like the 15 member states now will go across the, the sub-region and do boreholes in communities that have less, less or no access to pipe-borne water from the main grid. Now, in conclusion, I will let you also know that what I have done uh, as director of the Water Resources Management Center is to actually launch a research, a research which is actually a personal research, is for, is for uh, very, very interested and bright students in the sub-region I want them to undertake a research which will be financed ex exclusively by the ECOWAS. It's, it's a research on the theme, the effects of COVID-19 on water resources, energy resources, climate change, and the environment. So it's going to be on a competitive basis. We are going to advertise that on our website. We'll allow young students or graduates in the sub to compete and we'll make provision for two or three and then, you know, they will go out there, take certain countries as case studies, do their research, and they will come back and compile that report and put it to our website. In a nutshell, thank you very much. I don't want to take too much time. That's what I have for you this morning. And thank you very much. That uh, was a very interesting intervention and a very uh, interesting project that you mentioned there. So thank you very much. And uh, now I would uh, like to move on to our fourth and last speaker of this regional panel, uh, which is Mr. Omogbemi Omoloyu Yaya. Dr. Yaya, he's a researcher, a teacher, and administrator per excellence. Uh, at the very moment, he's the director of the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management. Uh, he's hydrologist and he forms part of the Nigerian Association of Hydrogeologists and he's also member of the Nigerian uh, Mining and Geosciences Society, uh, the International Association of Hydrogeologists and finally of the Geological Society of South Africa. He has published, uh, he has made several publications to his credit in national and international journals and books. Uh, Mr. Yaya, uh, a warm welcome to you. Um, the water sector is generally considered to be male dominated and hence uh, lacking of women participation, which translates in the low inclusion of gender consideration. So part of the question is how, how would you track the situation concerning the gender gap in Nigeria? In light of the regional center's role in and education within the water resource management framework, how does the center address this capacity building and education efforts? That's the first part. And then secondly, uh, personally, as a water scientist, uh, according to you, what is the role of sex disaggregated data on water resources in making the water sector more inclusive to women? Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The organizers of this workshop, including the regional center for integrated facilities and management, want to particularly appreciate the UNESCO 
multi-sector regional office from West Africa, Abuja, and the WWAP in uh, Perugia, Italy. I could remember in 2015, I was in Perugia, Italy, and uh, the president acting director, uh, Michela Isaletto, a hydrogeologist, a fellow hydrogeologist, was quite very impactful uh, during our visit. I'm happy to have her on this, on the, on this panel. Uh, I want to particularly thank the, uh, our executive director of the National Water Resources Institute of the General Center, who has ably and capably been handling the affairs of the regional center now, uh, due to his achievements, the minister deemed it fit to appoint him as the chairman of the governing board of the, of the second governing board of the regional center. Uh, it's equally online in this webinar, and I want to uh, equally thank the honorable minister at this point for his dynamic and pragmatic leadership, which uh, spreads all around the water sector in Nigeria, and has, has projected the regional center on the global domain. Uh, <clears throat> I want to, want to address what you have put before me now, but let me assure you that the water sector, no doubt, globally is male dominated. Why do I say globally? Because apart from Nigeria, where I have uh, uh, I've, uh, participated in a number of projects, and uh, going out of the country severally, I discovered that even meetings, uh, there is this uh, skewed uh, participation towards more men than women in, uh, in water issues. And I come to realize that a number of factors uh, can be attributable to it. Now, concerning the center, uh, we have been, we have, the question is the gender gap in Nigeria. How has the center been able to uh, cope with it? Not only in Nigeria, don't forget that the center covers the 15 West African uh, member states. Uh, and we have ensured that anything we do, we carry all of them along. In our own, on our own part, from beginning when the center was established and we began to operate, we decided that we must give gender a priority. There must be gender balance in everything we do as much as possible. Why? Because like I told you, which I'm going to mention later, there, surely there are constraints and which you cannot uh, be sure, you cannot run away from. And the constraints, when they are not of your doing, you just have to manage with them, which I will mention later. But for our efforts in uh, ensuring that there is gender balance in what we do, we do that by first ensuring that any projects or any uh, meetings we, uh, that are to be held or any research work that is to be done, we give some attention to women. When we are sending out invitation, in some cases, we even emphasize that uh, there should be gender balance in nomination or in selection, particularly the workshop in Accra in 2018, the Honorable Minister of Sanitation and Water uh, in Ghana, who was ably represented on this webinar, we attest to the fact that we had uh, sufficient women participation in that workshop. Why? Because out of the nominated two participants, and we said that each country to our plan is equally somehow women dominated area in the sense that we have uh, women more, if you go to the universities or the institutions where we study microbiology, biochemistry, see more of women. And we were very sure that that workshop, we will not have a uh, uh, scarcity of women participating. And true to our belief, the, uh, uh, the participation of the outcome was quite, without, quite impactful. But that was a bit different from 
the workshop we had in Nigeria uh, on uh, TCCP, which is from potential conflict to cooperation potential. When we sent out invitation to some ministries responsible for water resources in states in Nigeria, some of the permanent secretaries, when I called them on phone, I found that their nominees were men, men, men. And, you know, I said, why? Why is there no woman? One of, well, I saw two of the states told me blunt, bluntly that they don't, they don't have women in the sector at that uh, level and that category and in that uh, subject area to come, you know. So it was a bit somehow surprising, but which brings to the fact that we need to actually uh, begin to look at what are the hindrances, what are the bottlenecks to ensuring gender in uh, the water, in participation in the water sector, which I will very quickly go through. But before then, I want to say, place it on record that the regional center to, to show our consciousness in the area of gender mainstreaming, we had, uh, we, 17 of us participated in the recent workshop organized by UNESCO, that's, uh, by the IHE DEFT, Institute for Water Education uh, a couple of days ago. And we have participated for two days. It was full two days uh, workshop, international workshop on transboundary water governance and gendering, and gendering transboundary water governance. 17 of us from the regional center. And dominantly about 10 are women, were women. So which shows the, our, our readiness to, uh, uh, to give that, uh, what I would call that problem, a, a headlong uh, uh, attack and see that the women are given the rightful place in the sector. Now, finally, let me say that there are uh, a number of uh, impediments to, engendering, to, to ensuring gender balance. Number one, I would say religion. Number two, I would say tradition. Number three, I would say culture. Number four, I would say equally self, self uh, on consciousness let me put it that way so women are not ready to come out you know then uh, number five education both i remember when i was in the university in my class we were 49 who studied geology and graduated in 1984 out of the 49 none was a woman and the class before me which was to graduate in 85 only one woman only one lady was in that class out of about 27 so, which means that the gender imbalance itself has started from the beginning. It's not, we cannot begin to tackle it at the middle. So, we have to look at the whole framework from the beginning to the top. Now, at the, at the last uh, uh, transboundary water management workshop, we had uh, ways forward and we discovered too that we need to encourage more of women participation too in capacity building, you know, uh, opening up uh, scholarships for them in the area of water sciences, you know, and uh, gone are the days where people think that it is a male-dominated area. When you see women study engineering, say, why did you go to engineering? Why did you go to uh, microbiology? Why did you go to economics? Why did you go to political science? But well, these days, it is no, no more so. We should be able to encourage them because there's no doubt that when we have them in every fabric of uh, decision-making, uh, as policy formulation, uh, project implementation, and project management, and so on, and monitoring and evaluation, there's no doubt outputs seem to be much more uh, impactful than, than not. So I think the regional center is not doing badly in that area. And uh, I know for this project, we gladly accepted, as it mentioned, he hinted me about this uh, project, and we gladly accepted it. And why? Because we are a gender sensitive regional center, and we are ready to continue to pursue this agenda till we see that women are given their rightful place in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in water sciences and water uh, management. Finally, let me uh, say, that I that the regional center is uh, has come with way forward from the boundary uh, water governance workshop. 
and one of them is that every workshop we are going to hold, or every meeting we are going to hold, or every project, we will have space for uh, gender. If we are sending attendance uh, uh, notices, sorry, if we are sending a uh, uh, participation uh, list, there must be space for gender where we will show are you a man or are you a woman. And by that, we'll be able to monitor, we'll be able to know are we doing well or we need to do more to get to where we want to be and where we should be. So, by this, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I want to assure you, like I said, it's, uh, the doors are ever to embrace anything that has to do with gender and will be ready to pursue it with all ability as, as much as we can. Thank you very much and I wish you success. That's a very, that's very nice. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I'm sure we can all make it together. Uh, so thank you for providing your perspective and now we have concluded the, the regional uh, panel. So after hearing our distinguished uh, speakers' interventions based on their professional experience in the field of gender equality, water and climate change within the West Africa uh, region, uh, let's now go on to the, to the next session. I give the, the floor back to you, Enam. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Lauren, uh, for that, uh, anchoring that session. Um, thank you again to the panelists uh, for your very good input. Uh, just uh, as a one minute recap, we have been able to establish that the climate change impact is very vivid. It's very vivid in West Africa and there is women are worse hit. And because of these um, problems, they are even becoming more vulnerable because of the kind of uh, coping strategies of trekking for a very long distance to get water. And so they are becoming more vulnerable to you know, other hazards. And then, uh, well, the, and then there is need for doing a, a, a gender, um, there's need for good management of water resources. There's need for a gender responsive management of water resources. And then um, we also saw that um, there's also a gender gap which has to be bridged. And very happily, we have heard from the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management. And of course, they are UNESCO Category 2 Center, so they have to be very gender responsive that women are participating uh, very much in their, uh, in their activities. And then we also saw that it is good for us to uh, look at indigenous knowledge and um, also um, take note of negotiations, which is very important. Um, we also um, noted the activity that ECOWAS Commission is doing. This is very commendable, uh, trying to um, do something at the community uh, level to also make women cope better with this, uh, with this water stress caused by, caused by um, uh, climate change. And then also, uh, of course, launching a research work, which, which is quite commendable to get more information because for us to make this kind of gender responsive policies, we need information, so this is very commendable. And then of course, uh, we also saw from the, um, uh, UN women that there's need for awareness, there's need for capacity building and all that so that we will, we will be able to um, get women more involved in, uh, in water related uh, matters. Uh, having said that, um, we go on to the WAP toolkit, presentation of the WAP toolkit on sex segregated water data. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, I would like to introduce to us, uh, I call her an amazing scientist researcher. Uh, she was an assistant professor at the University of Torino, Italy, and researcher at the University of Arizona in Tucson, USA. And, also, and she has authored and co-authored several scientific publications. Uh, she has worked extensively in development of projects of several international organizations and donors, including EU, JEF, in Latin America, in Eastern Africa, in China, and in Europe. 
and she leads the gender portfolio of UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, supporting member states to develop gender responsive and evidence-based water policies, strategies, and programs. She has very rich experience in assessment of water resources and ecosystems and in the development of renewable resources. She is currently the coordinator and interim of UNESCO World Water Assessment Program. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Mrs. Michaela Mileto. You have the floor. Thank you, Enang, and uh, distinguished participants, uh, uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, and dear friends, good morning. Um, I'm very honored to be in this, uh, in this webinar and uh, have this opportunity to listen to you. We had a, a fantastic uh, two uh, panels, so welcome and and uh, panel and the expert, excellent expert from the region. And I think that uh, we have, I have learned a lot about West African region. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start uh, with my presentation. And uh, today um, we are going to to do something very concrete. Uh, we launch two actions that will take place uh, um, from now on and, uh, and for the next year. Uh, the first is, uh, um, is the launching of the, uh, of the toolkit on sex disaggregated water data, which is uh, the first time in the, in the African region. The second launch is the uh, WAP capacity development program that will be held in 2020, so starting now, and 2021 in the West Africa. Uh, we have decided to deliver the first uh, part of this program with you, and uh, I deeply appreciate the collaboration and the immediate response for this call from the UNESCO Abuja Multisector Regional Office and the UNESCO Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management of Nigeria. Thank you very much. So therefore, it is my pleasure to officially present to you the 2019 UNESCO WAP Toolkit on Sex, sex Disaggregated Water Data. But before this, I just want to have a few words on the uh, on what on our program very shortly. Uh, WAP stands for World Water Assessment, and it is a UNESCO program that has a specific mandate and objectives. Um, the first is monitoring, assessing, and reporting on the state of uh, global fresh water resources, on the state, on the use and management. Um, the second is uh, promote gender equality and uh, women empowerment according to the SDG 5 and the SDG 6, and totally in line with the UNESCO priority on gender equality. And last but not least, to assist countries uh, in developing their, um, their capacity in water resources uh, uh, assessment. Uh, our main product, everybody knows about it, is very popular, is the, the United Nations World Water Development Report. Here there is uh, the entire collections, and uh, which is the UN Water Flagship Report on Water and Sanitation Issues, and with a different team every 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 year. Uh, let's next uh, slide. Aligned to the UNESCO priority on gender equality, what promotes gender equality and women empowerment in the water domain addressing the urgent lack of sex disaggregated water data, imperative to advance gender equality in the management and governance of water resources, especially under climate change and climatic variability conditions. This is done with the creation of innovative methodologies, indicators, guidelines, and also with a comprehensive capacity development program. 
Um, I start with a, a little bit of the story. Uh, our journey uh, started in 2014 uh, when we uh, identified the first set of uh, uh, gender um, responsive indicator and, uh, and adopt methodology with uh, the help of a group of uh, experts coming from different uh, backgrounds. Uh, we were 30 members from UN agency, NGOs, uh, academia, etc. The so-called what water and gender working group, um, and uh, uh, this uh, um, this uh, this entire initiative was uh, was made possible thanks to the generous funding of the government government of Italy. Um, the entire exercise uh, um, uh, led to the publication of the first edition of the toolkit of sex disaggregated water data in 2015, which uh, basically um, uh, consisted of four, uh, four tools that you can see in the upper line of the, of the slide. Um, we had four indicators, uh, five priority topics. Now this meeting was, I don't know which line. And uh, 125 questions. Uh, let's go ahead. Next. Um, following this uh, publication, uh, 2015, the toolkit has gained a uh, uh, quite official recognition in the international arena, as you can see in this table. Among the others, the, the toolkit was officially endorsed uh, by the 23rd Intergovernmental Council of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Idol. Yes, that's so, yes. Um, yes. Can you please, uh, there is somebody that is talking very loud, if you can uh, switch off your, your mic. Thank you. In 2018. Okay, next uh, slide. So, voila, this is the second edition of the, uh, of the WAP Toolkit, published recently in 2019. And uh, I take the pleasure to, to launch it uh, for the first time in Africa today. The toolkit takes into account the 23rd agenda and in particular the interlinkages between SDG 5, gender equality and women empowerment, SDG 6, access to water and sanitation, and all the other interlinkages with the, uh, with the different SDGs. It has been built on the input of a field uh, test that we have done in two countries of Southern Africa, Namibia and Botswana, and in Central America, El Salvador, Honduras. The toolkit consists of four tools. The first is a new generation of gender responsive indicators. We went from the initial 40 indicators to uh, 105 indicators. Uh, under 10 priority topics or category. The second is the methodology. The third are the guidelines how to, 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 to use these indicators in the field surveys and also in the desk research. And eventually the fourth are the questionnaires with more than 300 questions for surveys and data uh, mining. Next, please. What are, we were talking about priority topics, but what are exactly these priority topics that we have selected to define the indicators? Well, the, uh, the, the topics that we, uh, we discussed today are quite crucial. We talk about climate change, governance, uh, decision-making, uh, involvement of women in this, uh, in, in all these uh, aspects. And uh, these topics are actually reflected into the SDGs, as you can see in, uh, in the table. And uh, they are also reflected into the categories or priority topics, uh, as we call it, 
um, that we uh, that include the WAP gender uh, responsive indicators. Uh, they are 10 and they are gender responsive water management, WASH, gender specific knowledge resources, transboundary water resources management and governance, water for agricultural uses, water for industry and enterprise, human rights, rights based uh, water resources management, water man migration, displacement and climate change, indigenous and traditional knowledge and community, community water rights, and last but not least, the water education and training. As, and I appreciate very much that my, my, my good friend uh, Jaya, uh, director of the regional center in Nigeria, has pointed out very clear in his intervention. Next, please. The next, oh yes, okay. Um, criteria, um, when, when, when you I, try to identify a set of indicator, you need the criteria to work on, on, on uh, to, uh, to really find the right profile for the each indicator. So we set up the a, a, a limited number of criteria for the first uh, for the first group of indicators, and we of course use the same for the second group. Um, and they are very you can read uh, them there in the, in the slide. They are very easy and uh, and common sense. First, they are they need to be applicable and relevant uh, across at least most of the regions. Um, they need to be feasible to collect. So um, uh, they, you have to consider the budget because uh, sometimes it is very expensive to do, to do this kind of, uh, of surveys or applications. Uh, support of, co of course, uh, the goals of enhancing women empowerment and promoting gender uh, equality in policy ma making. Uh, reflects uh, reflect diverse uh, sectoral and thematic concerns, and this is very much linked to the alignment to the uh, to the SDGs of the of the 2030 agenda, and uh, of course uh, transform re gender relations towards a more equitable state, and not just to account for current inequities. Uh, what so we uh, mean it with this is uh, to try to go ahead on not only to 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 work on the collection of uh, of this data, but also try to analyze and to use this data in a way that could inform our plannings, our programs, and policies. Next, and. The tool two is the methodology. Uh, the methodology is based on two main pillars. The one is uh, a combination of quantitative and qualitative data. And, and the use of qualitative data, and uh, of course, uh, all the experts uh, in, this, in this webinar knows well that are very important to add the perceptions uh, in the uh, in the in the in the data collection, uh, the second is uh, um, lifting the roof of the household, uh, which means uh, that we need to, to investigate as uh, uh, as much as we can on internal relations of the household by obtaining the views and opinions of both women and men. And it is then key to have access to each component of the household. Um, two, three, um, next slide. Uh, two, three contains uh, the guidelines that provide step-by-step -step guidance to the collections and analysis of the uh, sex disaggregated water data. So for instance, we have how a guidance on how to identify the users and the uses. And this is very important. I think that is key when you start a, 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 a 
the, a collection of, of, of this kind of data um, to know who is going to be the users, who is going to be the beneficiary. And, and also uh, Ms. Kemokai from UN Women was mentioned in this in her uh, previous uh, interventions. Another, another guidance is to select the right topic, the, the right indicators in the right priority topic, of course, which depends on the location and the, which depends on the, on the, on the type of, uh, of research that you are undertaking. And identify the best methods and have a proper code of conduct. So we have also to ask how my behavior can affect, can influence the result of my survey, for instance, of my research. Uh, let's go ahead. Next, okay, tool four is the ready to use uh, questionnaires. Each indicator is broken down in several sub indicators and for each one, uh, we formulate simple questions that can be asked by the interviews during the surveys or during a desk research uh, or other um, uh, research. Next. Well, we have heard from the panelists that, that uh, um, the impact of climate change and health related uh, issues are experienced uh, differently by women and men from a wide range of reasons. They have a different access to productive resources. Think about land tenure, think about water rights, as well as the innovative technologies and knowledge and are charged with different tasks in line with social norms. All the above makes that generally women are more impacted, more affected by climate change and the resulting water scarcity rather than men. Um, to this hand, there is the urgent need for a gendered approach to the differential impact of climate change on women and men. Gendered approach. And we have uh, uh, heard this uh, uh, repeating several times by the from the previous contributors. Next, thank you. Um, here there is a, a an example of uh, of an indicator. Um, as I said before, uh, among the, the ten topics covered by the toolkit, there is one that is water migration displacement and climate change, because of course there is a nexus between water, water stress or water scarcity affected by, by climatic variability or the uh, variation of climate change and the decision of migrating or otherwise to have a forced displacement. Under this topic, we have six indicators accompanied by 26 questions that you can use and step-to-step -step guidance on the methodologies that could be applied in order to collect this data. Next, please. Uh, talking about the capacity, since we are presenting now the, the, the capacity program, uh, we have here a very um, uh, a, a, an example of the application that we have done in Namibia. So when we test the, the, the indicators, and and it is about uh, uh, training. Looking at the indicator regarding water for income generation, so the application of another indi uh, indicator, we have been informed that 100% of female farm owners interviewed in the media have introduced new technologies in the last 10 years, compared to uh, about 89 uh, uh, of male farm, 89% of male farm owners. On the other hand, if you look at the graph on um, at the right side of the of the of the screen, you see that uh, um, 
regarding the access to training, none of the female owners that are in green um, versus 38% of the male owners that received any formal and formal training on the new technology they installed. These findings show a need to enhance a gender balanced access and control over resources. In this case, training opportunities is also a, a, a resource which are uh, key for empowering women. Next, please. As you have seen from, from this data, what was clear from the field testing is that there is a long way to go uh, and capacity development is really key if we want to advance in this, uh, in this endeavor. And in particular, with the final target to close the gender data gap in the water resources uh, domain. Therefore, it is with great pleasure that I present to you the UNESCO Wealth Capacity Development Program for 2020-2021 for the region of uh, West Africa. It is the first region that we that we we we, we start with, and uh, and this is of course uh, uh, our part in the strategy to help closing the data gap and promote gender equality in the water sectors. Um, there are uh, specific objectives for this uh, program. The first is uh, assess women's specific roles in water challenges and how their coping strategies contribute to achieving water security also in, uh, in, in emergency situations like uh, pandemics or conflicts or um, in the way of immigration. The second objective is prepare and discuss case studies from the different countries, which will be published in a UNESCO thematic publication by the name of Water and Gender Case Studies from West African countries. So this will be the last product of a work that we will do together to collect this, the best practices, example stories from, from your countries. Um, and the trainees will, will uh, uh, collect this information, prepare the, the case studies, present the case studies to the other trainees, and eventually we will collect all this uh, uh, research and publish the, the, uh, the uh, paper. Um, the third is provide training on the collection and analysis of sex disaggregated water data, applying, of course, our indicators, and learn, because this is important, not only uh, collecting, but also learn how this data, data can, uh, uh, can be uh, uh, useful to formulate uh, evidence-based uh, policies and to develop uh, a gender baseline for the for the for each country. Uh, next, please. This uh, unique uh, capacity development program is possible thanks to the partnership with the uh, UNESCO Abuja Multisector Regional uh, Regional Office. Thank you so much and also in collaboration with the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management under the auspices of, of UNESCO. Thank you, Jaya. Um, it is uh, tailored for the moment uh, for the English-speaking West African countries for, and, uh, and uh, it will span for a period of approximately one year and a half. Following this high-level webinar, uh, which introduced the program. Uh, early next year, we plan to have a technical webinar with the trainees in which the selected um, trainees will receive instruction, instructions on the year activities, in particular, the identification and preparation of the best practices and case studies from the different countries that I was talking before. 
Um, this work will continue during, um, during the year 2001 under WAP supervision, of course, and, uh, and uh, it will be completed hopefully with the, in the second part of the year uh, when we, we hopefully be free from COVID, let's cross fingers and pray, um, with the face-to-face -face workshop uh, with the participants in Abuja. Uh, other regions and sub-regions um, are targeted as well, so we have other examples, we have uh, uh, Latin America, we have Asia, the seeds, the Pacific seeds, and we, we will have also in Africa other sub-regions that, that will be targeted in the following years. With this, it is my honor to declare the West Africa Capacity Development Program 2020-2021 officially started. So with this, next. With this, I think that I concluded my, uh, my presentation. I thank you very much and see please my contact and also there is a barcode um, from which you can download the, the toolkit for free, of course, because it is a UNESCO open access product. Thank you very much. Back to you, Enan. Thank you very much, Michaela. Thank you. I'm sure if we were having a physical program, we would have given you a standing ovation. Thank you very much for presenting um, that um, toolkit and also uh, in taking us through the components of the uh, WAP capacity building which has started already uh, thank you we hope that um, we'll be able to go through this and then um, uh, the, the different programs that we have here marked for 2020 2021 uh, our time is fast spent but we will uh, look at some of the questions that we have in the q and a box uh, we have a couple of questions there for uh, our panelists um we will uh, call on Ejiro and Bless to handle this. I think the first one on green economy will, tr will skip it um, because this is something that the ministry can write to UNESCO office in Abuja. Um, for the next, I think um, I'll ask Ejiro. Yeah, I'll ask Ejiro to um, handle the first and the second questions. And then um, the question to to Kwaben, I mean, question by Akwasi Saprong, and there's a question by um, Biboma. Yes. So handle the first, exclude the the one on on green economy, and then uh, do the first, the second, and the third, and then Blessed will come in with the 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 other two. Ejiro, the floor is yours, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm standing on the existing protocol and I'm going to be taking the questions first. Um, the first one goes to engineer Kwabena Gasseduku of Amcal. And it says, is there any partnership with grassroots youth-led organizations to generate cess disaggregated data on young girls and women with regards to water and climate change in Ghana. So did you get that? Uh, yes, please, yes, 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 please. Okay. There's also yeah. another question for you. Should I go ahead with the question or you want to intervene first? I think you could take, uh, you could take all these questions so that okay. uh, he can, yes. Let me take the second one. Traders in the informal sector are women, dominant, sorry. Traders in the informal sector are women dominant. They rely heavily on water for their livelihoods and contribute greatly to activities that affect climate and sanitation. What strategies are available to help reduce unhealthy practices that contribute to climate change? Did you get that, sir? Engineer Duku, please, uh, can you attend to the question, maybe in, in two minutes? Okay, thanks Thank so you. much, madam. All right. Currently, uh, from the grassroots, uh, the just uh, sex education data is something like currently we are not doing in 
collaboration with most of our partner ministries like uh, Ministry of Environment. To see I can actually help come up with the general security agreement to know what pertains to ensure that in terms of policy, policy formulation, you can actually come up with policy that, that will help to address the issues of women, like all, all women of, 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 of all groups. So it's something that we are doing. We normally, we normally have to do the work in collaboration with, uh, with CSOs and NGOs in the watch sector environment. So at least you can understand how all this work done. It's not something you can do on our own as, as, as government, you know, on our partners to help us. But also, we're also doing, doing projects. As part, as part of all the way for it, normally pick, pick and do this a baseline data to know the sense of integration of, 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 of the very groups so that you can also have you no know, which groups fall into which and by, by which portion. So at least in terms of policies you are going to develop, and even in terms of even the project, the project outputs, all those basic needs can, can be addressed. As part of the mixed multiple declared classes survey we did last two years, it, it was part of, of the baseline uh, 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 target or, or the data we, we collected. So it's still work in progress. Currently, we are doing what we call the national uh, watch sector good indicators. We are 12 in number, and one of them is actually responds to, I think, I think go 13 of it. I think the go 11 actually of it actually responds to this sex uh, disability data. So it's something we are doing, and hopefully we'll be by the end of the year, we have, we have the, the best world baseline figures, which also work in partnership with the Ghana Sector Customs, because we need all the collaborative efforts of all our partners to show that this is done and done well. On the of climate change among market women, or why we need an informal sector, yes. Most of our women are money finding themselves in an informal uh, 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 space, se sector space. So many times we try to bring up programs for them that also help them to really they can also integrate the impact of climate change, or that also, that also enhance climate change adaptation. Recently, as part of our interventions, we are putting up uh, watch facilities within the various uh, market areas. So at least when they go to work, they can actually have places of convenience to work, either to change over or to or to or to freshen up doing it before and also after, after their, their daily activities. Something we are currently doing also doing our partner, which is like the Ministry of inner, inner Cities. So they can actually have decent watch streams across, so at least. Uh, Women or most of the people who are normally forming the informal, informal status space actually have all these places to, to freshen up or to, to, to address or to address most, most, most of the wash needs. Because normally, when you find yourself in open space at times in the market, there are no convenient areas of, uh, of wash tools and it becomes a challenge for, for most, most of the women who normally find themselves in the market. So we want to put out this wash facility for them. So at least once they are there to do their work, at least they have these different places to, to use during their, their time, the, the time they spend at the market. So this will be for now. So if there are any other questions, please, I'm, 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 I'm turning back. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Engineer Duku. Uh, Bless, uh, I'll give you the floor to take the other question for UN Women. Bless, the floor is yours. Um, there are two questions here directed to the UN Women representative, Ms. Salamatsu. And the first one is, kindly share any women-led initiative on water and climate change for economic empowerment in Ghana or Nigeria. Ms. Lamato, did you get that? Yes, Just please go ahead, ahead with the yeah, two okay. questions so, so that she can address one, them. Mm. Okay, the second one is, yeah. to what extent do you involve women in community data collection about issues of water that affect them? So this is the second question. So Ms. Lamati. Okay, um, thank you very much. Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, for UN Women, and uh, specifically I can speak to a joint project that we are implementing alongside FAO, ILO, and UNIDO, which is um, Climate Smart Agriculture. And in this particular um, project, um, we have components that are um, actually introduce a means of conservation. And particularly we have what we, uh, we call drip irrigation, which actually reduces um, labor by something like 60%. Where women themselves are actually supported to be able to do this so that they are also able to cultivate their plants um, right through uh, the year. And they are not just dependent on the rainy season. Um, and in this particular project, we also have um, a component that supports the women um, in terms of their advocacy, we build their capacity so that they lead the advocacy events for them to be able to have access to water um, resources because 
um, we learned that in some communities, this is also um, a problem. There is another um, initiative. This is not supported by UN Women directly, but it would be good to share just to show that it doesn't have to be um, all technical. There is this women-led climate change um, advocacy radio um, drama in Imo State, where um, the project empowers women farmers to um, produce and bro broadcast on climate change adaptation and management you know, strategies using radio drama. And we are in there actually also talking about risk associated with climate change and it is context specific so that their um, listeners, um, women particularly, could be able to also learn from those. Um, the second part had to do with um, in, um, data collection. Well, data collection um, comes normally in terms of our monitoring events. And we also have these women, we actually train them on how um, they are able to actually see who are who are the users of some of these resources that are available. And that is where, in fact, we are able to learn that uh, in some communities, access to some specific um, water resources is also limited. So they are involved in data collection and then they give us this information. We analyze and we are able to um, produce this in, pro in form of projects that we can also use as interventions on their behalf. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for attending to that question. I will now call um, Lauren to take the last question uh, by Mina. Sorry, we can't take all the questions because of time. I think that, is, uh, that question is addressed to Michaela. So Lauren, please, could you read that so that Michaela can attend to it? Yes, thank you. Uh, so the question that we received was, uh, during the presentation of um, Ms. Mileto, how can the academia be part of this process? And uh, then the second part of the question is, we have environmental clubs that work with children as emerging environmental leaders. How can we mainstream the toolkit as part of our climate change pack and have one of your technical supervisors to, I believe this means to be involved? Michaela, please, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the, for, for the question to address the academia. And in fact, uh, um, a part of our uh, members in the, in the Water and Gender Working Group are from academia. So uh, we, we, we work very, very closely with them in the identification of the indicators. Um, I think that for the academia, there are a kind of broad array of, of, of potential actions. One is, uh, that comes to my mind, is of course the, the one on, uh, in terms of educational um, uh, didactic purpose. Um, we, uh, and I, uh, I give you this, um, I share with you this story. We, um, um, not uh, a lot uh, of time ago, we had uh, a, a, a uh, we have been contacted by the University of Waterloo in Canada from the Faculty of Environment uh, from a professor that wanted to use the, uh, the indicators uh, in their uh, courses, in their modules. So this, this is a very nice uh, um, uh, action uh, in, in terms of the use of the, of the toolkit uh, used in a way that today the, the, uh, the students can, uh, can actually uh, come into the uh, topics directly through the modules, through the, uh, through the uh, exercise. Another, another, um, another purpose, another way to use um, is, uh, um, is uh, through the, um, the awareness. Um, it's an awareness purpose um, that the university can, can, can have because of course, any times that, uh, uh, that we discuss this with the student, with youth is important because we, we have to share um, um, the, um, the way in which we uh, can include um, the uh, gender aspect and gender and gender equality aspect and uh, women empowerment in terms of the SDGs 
uh, achievement into the uh, discourse with, uh, with the young people so that they are prepared and they are actually act uh, directly in the field and in their lives. And for the children, um, the, I think that uh, um, the indicators as, uh, as they are, um, are quite complex. I think that uh, uh, it is uh, absolutely needed uh, a supervision or a tutoring in the use of the indicators for the adults, for the, for the people. For, for the children, we need to rearrange uh, the indicators in a way uh, that the children can understand and can and can use the, the indicators um, and, and fully and, and in an enjoyable manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela, for attending to that uh, question. Um, Dear participants, we will definitely um, share with you um, the slides of um, the toolkit and also um, necessary materials that will help you follow up this um, event as we have not been able to take all your questions because of time. Uh, we are now entering the, thank you very much to um, Eduro, Blessed and Lauren for moderating the session. Uh, we're now going to uh, the closing session. And uh, the closing session is going to be very short. Um, we're going to have speaking to us uh, a brilliant hydrologist. Uh, he has been a lecturer at the Amadou Bello University, Zaria. He's a one-time director of dams and reservoir operations in the Nigerian water uh, sector. And he is currently um, the executive director and chief executive of National Water, National water Resources Institute, Kaduna. He's also uh, the chair of the governing board of the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management. Uh, and then um, he's, he's been one person also that has been actively uh, supporting UNESCO's activities, technical activities, and uh, ensuring that we take forward this action. The, please permit me to, in, to call to, the, uh, to address us, Professor Emmanuel Adano. Prof, the floor is yours, sir. Hello, Prof, are you there? Hello? Prof Adano, okay. The yeah, floor is yours, sir. Yes, sir, we can uh, hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Emma. First of all, I have to appreciate our minister for being there. He's always with us. Yes. And the Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources of Ghana and the regional and um, multisectoral uh, director here. We appreciate you. Now, we... In the Institute, National Water Resources Institute, apart from being the host, we're also into researches and training of just all aspects of water resources, especially the middle level. I will have certain programs that will tie up with this idea of uh, <clears throat> gender mainstreaming. Sometimes we, for instance, we're discussing this right now because we believe something is not complete. Now we have to identify what is lacking and then try to provide an environment for us to improve. The Water Resources Institute, apart from the training, we also go into serious researches in water management. And water management and even the physical aspect of it. Now, a lot of uh, our speakers today mentioned that uh, women have not been very much involved in water. It is nobody's fault. They are not intentionally disadvantaged. Sometimes they don't feel that anything in water is basically, is for everybody. But now that we know we can encourage them to go in, we are coming out with programs in the Institute and working in collaboration with the RC, RBM. Now, the Federal Ministry of Water Resources has given us the opportunity to draw out a curriculum for WASH water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. And this curriculum is going to start from primary school to university. And we have already had two meetings. The curriculum is almost available now. Maybe in the next two weeks, we're going to have it. And we have made a special section of it for women. 
Now, if it is facility development, like um, boreholes, you construct boreholes. Now, we would like to see if women would be able to manage this borehole, repair the rigs, sorry, um, uh, the pumps, and also manage the water sharing in the community. We intentionally make sure that women should handle this, and then the sustainability of it. We may have one kind of, uh, I would say, an appealing sense of uh, ownership. Whether you like it or not, they are the people managing the water we have in our houses. And if you talk of uh, climate change, climate change might not just refer to lack of water, it could also be too much of it. Now, we have conflicts arising from lack of water. Today, we have a lot of uh, IDPs, settlements that are not permanent, and it's because a lot of people have lost their livelihood because of lack of water. So they go around attacking the whole environment, finding something to do. Now, in a settlement, for instance, the federal government can provide the facility for them, the water. We want to target the women in such environments to manage the water for them. We are also in a water management very soon, I'm sure in two, three weeks. We're going to come out with a program, we'll flash it, the minister is going to flash it up for us, on water management, household water management. And we make sure women by the ones we put forward, because they can appeal to our conscience. So these are things that we are doing in collaboration with our uh, RCRDM, but it is also our responsibility. So we are always ready to accept any kind of responsibility you give to us, and also try to share our experiences and projects we intend to undertake. And I think uh, there's no forum better than this to do that. I personally don't have too much to talk about because everybody has spoken too much about it. And I, I think if we, all of us here, are committed to it, we can achieve it. And if it's Water Resources Institute, we are 100% committed to this. And uh, the director was mentioning this. We have a special unit that we know women must go into. They are very concerned about uh, sanitation, and not because we read microbiology, biochemistry, and all this. We want them to read other things too that can provide facilities for water. So, and if you know, um, there was a slide I saw, a lady is not there pushing some jelly cans of water. Now, if you notice that water consumption, amount of water you consume, is a question of water collection journey time. If you, call, if you go around, take two hours to just get a jerry of 50 liters of water, the woman in the house will apportion this water to various uses for hygiene, for feeding, even the livestock, and they are good at it. So why we say we should make sure that women know this very well, we should also try to make sure that the water collection journey time is reduced because it takes a lot of the working hours from other things. So I think while all of us are trying to get this done, we should also appeal to those who are supposed to provide it, the facilities to make sure that the water collection journey time is substantially reduced so that our women have other things to, to cater for. So I think we're all in line with you and we're always ready, please, anytime you need us, we're around there to support or contribute to our little quota. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Definitely, you're always there to uh, support our programs. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to working with the National Water Resource Institute and, of course, the Regional Center for Integrated River Basin Management. Uh, taking forward actions from this uh, event. Thank you very much. And uh, to this end, I would also like to call on the acting director of the UNESCO Regional Office in the person of Mr. Lamin. He's spoken with, uh, to, he welcomed us, so um, he will give us some parting words. Thank you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Enang. Uh, the honorable ministers, 
from both Nigeria and Ghana, uh, distinguished uh, participants, uh, the different presenters. I think uh, this has been a very fruitful session. And uh, we can assess that by the quality and quantity of the presentations, uh, both from a political point of view and an operational and technical point of view. I think uh, uh, we have a lot of things uh, to be taken away, you know, to continue both for the planning, uh, decision making, and uh, resources allocation pro purposes uh, pertaining to the how women, especially women and uh, disadvantaged women living in those uh, rural places, hard to reach places, how they can access, you know, to basic social services, including water, which is the most crucial for uh, a human kind life. So, uh, I would like really to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar and uh, all the participants, but more importantly, all the political leaders, the decision makers that made this happen today. I would like to thank you all for your participation and uh, to wish you a very safe time during this COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamin, for your kind words, kind parting words. Thank you. And uh, on this note, I also like to call uh, Ms. Michaela to give his uh, her closing remarks. And then we'll see our, and then we'll have a short video, one minute, and then say our goodbyes. Thank you. Ms. Michaela. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Oh, yes, I will be very short. I just uh, want to once again convey our appreciation to the, uh, to the distinguished participants of the welcome panel and the, and the uh, expert panel. We really appreciate uh, their contributions. And I would like to close this webinar with the, with the trailer that uh, WAP has produced, it's very short. And uh, feel free to, to download it from, uh, from you, uh, YouTube um, for using it disseminating it, dancing with it, do what you want, but, but uh, uh, spread the voice and the call. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, all the best for you and stay safe, stay well. Please the train. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela. <laughs> Thank you. We are also dancing here. Michaela Thank you so is much. a great dancer. Yes, he's a great dancer. Thank you very much. And on this note, uh, we really want to thank um, especially the excellences, your ex and the excellency, and the Minister for Water Resources for honoring us. Thank you so much. And the Minister for Water and Sanitation in Ghana for sending a representative. And indeed, all our very distinguished panelists, thank you so much. Thank you, participants, for holding forth. I can see that we were still like fluctuating between 83 and 75 from the beginning to the end. Thank you so much. And then thank you to, to the team in WAP, Michaela, Lauren, Barbara, um, Michael and Simona, thank you so much. And then here in Abuja, thanks to Pressy, thanks to Bean, to Ejuro, 
to blessed and then thanks to our acting director mr lamin you have been very supportive thank you so much colleagues thank you for our other colleagues that are attending with we thank you and then thank you to abu for finding time to be with us like i said we were going to re really will share the resources of this with you and we for the um, nominees from the four countries ghana liberia nigeria and sierra leone will come back to you um to take forward the training uh on on the toolkit thank you so much and uh, now we're saying our bye byes thank you thank you so much thank you Maybe, uh, Pressy, you should play the music again so that we just dance and dance, dance away. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>